we have finished uh, the law, the five books of Moses, uh, the Pentateuch, it's variously described, the Torah, and now we're going to move into the uh, historical books. I want to read uh, Joshua 1, 1 to 9. This is, this, this is the opening verses of this uh, book. Even though we'll show you a little later that chapter 24 is really probably the key chapter in the book. But this is, I read this tonight because it gives you a sense of continuity of where we've been. So stand with me if you would. Follow along in your Bibles. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is what it's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And you see in this, this transition, Moses, my servant, is dead. And now Joshua steps into that role, takes the mantle of Moses upon him, and and over and over God says, be strong, courageous. Don't be dismayed. Just as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's It's a theme that's picked up by Jesus as he stands on the Mount of Ascension. Assumption, I'll be with you always. And so let's, uh, let's study this tonight and learn a little more about this book, perhaps, as we look at the big picture of it. Thank you. Be seated. Well, when we move from the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we move into the section called the historical books. And so I'm going to give you just a brief intro to the historical books before we actually go into Joshua's overview. Uh, there are 12 historical books, uh, and they really pick up where the story of, uh, of, of Deuteronomy left off. And they describe various aspects of the occupation, the settlement of Israel in the Promised Land. Uh, the transition from, uh, from this individual, uh, what we call a theo- theocratic period, to the monarchical, to the, to the period of the, of the monarch, and from the monarch uh, on and on. We're going to see this in a minute. So let's look at, uh, at these books. First of all, let's divide them into sections. There's the theocratic books. These cover uh, what we're looking at tonight, about 1405 B.C. to 1043 B.C. It covers uh, settlement in Canaan and life during the time of the judges. You're going to see Joshua hand off that, and we'll look at that next week. Israel was a nation ruled by God, and that's why you call these particular books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the theocratic aspect of the historical books. Um, We'll see what Joshua's about. Judges, real quickly. Uh, the disobedience of Judges stands in contrast to the faithful obedience found in Joshua. In fact, we'll tell you later that, that in all these historical books, Joshua is the only one where the nation does not experience a major failure uh, in the part of leadership or in the part of the people. There's a, the one little episode with Achan or Achan, as the, as the folks of the Bible Project call him. Um, but other than that, Joshua is, sets it apart. 
So you go from obedience, Joshua, to the disobedience of the judges. And we're gonna, you're going to look at these folks. Uh, they take part in, uh, in the Canaanites' idolatry. The judges, when we look at it, there's seven cycles of foreign oppression, repentance, and deliverance. It just helps they go through. Um, and they don't learn. Ruth is a little, a little book that kind of uh, puts light on, a, uh, on something called the, uh, uh, the law of leveret marriage, where, you, where the kinsman redeemer steps up and takes care of the kinsman who would otherwise be without help. And it's a, pow- be a powerful picture of, of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. The story of Ruth occurs in the days of the judges, uh, and it's a powerful picture of God's faithfulness. Then you have the monarchical uh, books. And this is the time of the monarchy. So you move from, from Joshua, the patriarch, to the judges, several people leading, to the, to the kings. And, and these six books in the, in the monarchical period uh, go from 1043 B.C. to 586 B.C., where you have the, the destruction that comes at the hands of the uh, Babylonians. You have 1 Samuel. Uh, and then Second Samuel, uh, First Samuel, uh, he is, he's, Samuel's the bridge that carries Israel from the from the time of the patriarchs into the uh, into the time uh, of the monarchs. They keep clamoring for a king. You're going to see that. Give us a king, like the rest of the nations have a king. And so Saul is selected, of course, and then David sort of serves as king elect in the background. Second, the second book of Samuel. When Saul experiences his demise, David steps up and reigns for seven years over Judah, another 33 years over the 12 reunited tribes, uh, a reign characterized by great blessing until he commits adultery and murder. Then you have these books of kings. Uh, Solomon uh, brought the kingdom to its political and economic zenith, uh, but the wise Solomon made some very foolish choices when he engaged in several, uh, in these multiple uh, marital treaties is what they were. After his death, he he married, I think, a a bunch of foreign women. After his death at 931, the kingdom is divided when when two of his sons uh, fight with one another. And only the southern kingdom remains remains subject to what we call the Davidic, Davidic dynasty. Second Kings is the story of the divided uh, kingdom. And it takes Israel uh, and, to, and Judah, and that's what they were called, uh, uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom, to their bitter ends. Uh, one falls uh, under the sway of the Assyrians in 722 when they take them captive, and then uh, Judah lasts longer, but they ultimately fall to the Babylonians in 605 and 586. Then you have the books of Chronicles. Um, they give basically God's perspective on the history of Israel from the time of David to the two captivities. Gives a, a long a nine-chapter genealogy from Adam to the family of Saul and then a life of, of David. Second Chronicles uh, continues this narrative with the life of Solomon and it focuses on the construction and dedication of the temple. And then it traces the history of the kings of Judah uh, giving their, the ups and downs of that. So those, that's the monarchical uh, books of history. Then you have the restoration books, and, and you see those, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And they describe the return of the remnant of the Jews to their homeland after, after 70 years uh, of captivity. Uh, they're led in the period from 536 to 420 by Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. The book of Ezra... Uh, Describes the aftermath of the uh, uh, of Babylon conquering, being conquered. Pardon me, by Persia in 539 B.C. and then Cyrus, king of Persia, issues a decree in 536 that allowed the Jews to return to Palestine. Zerubbabel led about 50,000 to Jerusalem to b- rebuild the temple, and years later Ezra the priest returns with almost 2,000 Jews. That's that's the book of Ezra. The Nehemiah, uh, the temple is built. But the wall of uh, Jerusalem still lay in ruins. So Nehemiah obtained permission, supplies, and money from the king of Persia to rebuild the walls in 444 B.C. 
And after the walls were built, Ezra and Nehemiah led the people in, in revival and reforms. It's a very powerful spiritual time, and, and they rediscover the book of the law. Esther, the story of Esther took place between chapters 6 and 7 of Ezra. Uh, most of the Jews chose to remain in Persia, uh, but their lives were in danger because of a plot to exterminate them. So God intervenes sovereignly, uses Esther and Mordecai to deliver the people. So that's, that's just a snapshot of the historical books, where we're, where we're going to be going. But tonight we look at Joshua, the first of the 12 uh, books of history. And Joshua builds this pretty clear link between the Pentateuch, that is the, the five books of the law, books of Moses, to the rest of Israel's history. Joshua undertakes three military campaigns uh, involved, involving where he engages more than 30 enemy armies. Uh, and the people learn a lesson throughout this, uh, this historical experience under Joshua's leadership. And Joshua, by the way, proves to be a very capable leader. And here's the lesson. Victory comes through faith in God and obedience to his word rather than military might or numerical superiority. There's a hymn we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, the, the hymn's called Trust and Obey, and that's the order. <clears throat> trust and Obey. Obedience without trust is legalism. Trust without Obedience is a fraud. It's not real faith. And so this is the lesson, that the, the, to trust and obey. The first half of Joshua describes the, the seven-year conquest of the land. The second half, chapters 13 to 24, relates the partitioning and settlement of the land among the 12 tribes. I want us to watch now uh, the, the brief video from the Bible Project, which gives a summary of Joshua. They do a very good job with this, I believe. The book of Joshua. Let's back up and remember the story so far. So God chose Abraham, and then his family became the people of Israel, who are then enslaved down in Egypt. And so through Moses, God rescued Israel out of Egypt. He made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, and he brought them through the wilderness. So Israel then camped outside the promised land, and Moses called them to obey God's commands so that they could show all the other nations what God is like. The book of Joshua picks up right after Moses has died, and Israel's ready to enter the land. So the story of Joshua is designed with four main movements. Joshua first leads Israel into the promised land, and then once they're there, they meet all this hostility from the Canaanites, and so they engage them in battle. Then after their victories, Joshua divides up the promised land as the inheritance for the 12 tribes, and then the book concludes with these final speeches that Joshua gives to the people. So let's dive in and we'll see how all of it flows together. The first section begins with Moses' death, and Joshua is appointed as Israel's new leader. And the author intentionally presents Joshua as a new Moses. So like Moses, Joshua calls the people to obey the Torah, which means the covenant commands that they were given at Mount Sinai. And then Joshua sends spies into the land, just as Moses did back in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, except it goes way better this time. In fact, even some Canaanites turn and follow the God of Israel. Joshua then leads all Israel across the Jordan River and into the land. Just like the sea parted for Moses in the Exodus, so here the river Jordan parts and the priests carry the Ark of the Covenant across, leading all Israel with them. Now, in chapter 5, the story transitions. So the people look back to their roots as God's covenant people, and so the new generation is circumcised and they celebrate their first Passover in the land. But then they turn and prepare to go forward. And Joshua has this crazy encounter with a mysterious warrior who, it turns out, is the angelic commander of God's army. And Joshua asks, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the warrior responds, neither. Which shows that the real question here is whether Joshua is on God's side. It makes clear that this whole story is not about Israel versus the Canaanites. Rather, this is God's battle. And Israel is going to play the role of spectators or sometimes supporters in God's plan. 
which leads to the next section. We find stories about all these conflicts that Israel had with different Canaanite groups. And the first part retells the story of two battles in detail, and that's followed by a series of short stories that condense years of battles into a few brief summaries. So the first two battles are against Jericho and then Ai, and they offer these contrasting portraits of God's faithfulness versus Israel's failure. At Jericho, Israel is to take a completely passive approach. So they let God's presence in the ark lead them around the city to music for six days. And just like Rahab turned to the God of Israel, maybe the people of Jericho would do the same, but they don't. And so on the seventh day, the priests blow the trumpets and the walls come falling down, leading Israel to victory. The point of the story is that God is the one who will deliver his people. Israel simply needs to trust and wait. Now the next story of the battle at Ai makes the opposite point. So there's this Israelite named Achan, and he steals from Jericho some of the devoted goods that were to belong to God alone, and then he lies about it. It's a pretty lame move after all that God has done for Israel. And so Israel goes into battle with the city of Ai, and they're totally defeated. And it's only after humble repentance and severely dealing with Achan's sin that Israel gains victory. And so together, these two stories, they're placed right up front to make an important point. If Israel is going to inherit the land, they have to be obedient and trust in God's commands. They don't get special treatment. Now, the second part of this section begins with the Gibeonites, a Canaanite people group, and they do just what Rahab did as they turn to follow the God of Israel and they make peace with Israel. This is in contrast to all of these other Canaanite kings who start to form alliances and coalitions and they want to destroy Israel. So Israel engages them in battle and they win by a landslide. And so this whole section concludes with this summary list of all of these victories won by Moses and then by Joshua. Now, let's stop for a second, because odds are that these stories and the violence in them, they're going to bother you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're bound to wonder, like, didn't Jesus say to love your enemies? Why is God declaring war here? So first, why the Canaanites? The main reasons are actually given earlier in the biblical story. It's that the culture of the Canaanites had become extremely morally corrupt, especially when it comes to sex. Go check out Leviticus chapter 18. And they also widely practice child sacrifice. Go see Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so God didn't want these practices to influence Israel. The Canaanites had to go. Which raises the second question. Did God actually command the destruction of all the Canaanites like a genocide? So at first glance, you know, you look at the phrases used in these stories. They totally destroyed them. They left no survivor or anything that breathed. But when you look a second time more closely, you'll see that these phrases are clearly hyperbole and not literal. So go back to the original command about the Canaanites in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Israel is first told to drive out the Canaanites, but then to totally destroy them. And then that's followed by commands to not intermarry with them or enter into business deals with them. So you can't marry someone that you've destroyed. I think you get the point. The same idea applies to the stories in Joshua. Look closely. So for example, we're told in Joshua chapter 10 that Israel left no survivors in the cities of Hebron or Debir. But then later in chapter 15, we see these towns and they're still populated by Canaanites. And so what we're seeing is that Joshua fits in with other ancient battle accounts by using non-literal hyperbolic language as part of the narrative style. And so the word genocide doesn't actually fit what we see here, especially in light of the stories about the Canaanites who did turn to the God of Israel, like Rahab or the Gibeonites. God was open to those who would turn to him. The last thing to think about is that these stories mark a unique moment in Israel's history. These battles were limited to the handful of people groups living in the land of Canaan. With all other nations, Israel was commanded by God to pursue peace. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 20. So the purpose of these battle stories was never to tell you, the reader, to go commit violence in God's name. Rather, they show God bringing his justice on human evil at a unique moment in history and how he delivered Israel from being annihilated by the Canaanites.
Now, let's go back to the book's design. After years of battles, we see an aging Joshua, and he starts dividing up the land for the 12 tribes of Israel. And most of this section is like lists of boundary lines. And let's be honest, it's kind of boring. It's like reading a map that has no pictures. But for the Israelites, these lists were super important. This was the fulfillment of God's ancient promises to Abraham that his descendants would inherit the promised land. And so now it was all coming to pass right down to the detail, which leads to the final section. Joshua gives two speeches to the people that are very similar to the final speeches of Moses in Deuteronomy. Joshua reminds them of God's generosity, how he brought them into the land and rescued them from the Canaanites. And so he calls them to turn away from the Canaanite gods and be faithful to the covenant they made. If they do, it will lead to life and blessing in the land. But if they're unfaithful, Israel will call down on itself the same divine judgment that the Canaanites experienced. They'll be kicked off the land into exile. And so Joshua leaves Israel with a choice. What is Israel going to do? That's the big question that looms as the story ends, and that's the book of Joshua. Again, a very good summary, and I appreciate the way that he treats the... uh, the command to annihilate uh, the peoples. And it's interesting to me that the rationale behind it is uh, the gross sexual immorality and the gross uh, destruction of children. And you look around at our culture and you realize, you know, we're, we're not far from that. In fact, we may be deeper into it than even the Canaanites were. And so... With the gospel, we're commanded to kill them with love, to pour keeping coals upon them. So it's a great, a great summary of the book. Let's look back to it now and then move through it as we've been moving through these other books. Try to do this in a timely way. There's, when, you, when you look at the divisions of them, as I mentioned earlier, there's first of all the conquest of Canaan, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 13, verse 7. And within that, there's this preparation of Israel for the conquest. Uh, This is on the Jordan River. On the Jordan River for about a month in preparation. Then they actually go in and and engage in the conquest of Canaan. This is about a seven-year venture. And so then there's the second section after you see this conquest of Canaan. By the way, one... Even once they've, once they've fought these wars for seven years, there's still, as you can imagine, pockets of resistance, still places that have to go. But they've essentially, in seven years, conquered Canaan, conquered the Promised Land. And then there's settlement in Canaan, which takes place from chapter 13, verse 8, to the end of the book. Uh, that's about an 18-year pro- process. And there's two and a half tribes east of Jordan and nine and a half tribes west of Jordan. I want to speak to that real quickly. You know the 12 tribes. You know the names of the 12 tribes. When you get to this place with the new generation coming up, you have uh, Joseph was one of the 12 sons. And within the family of Joseph, there's this tribe of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim. And so I'm just telling you, if you're reading through this and you, and you don't see the name of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim take Joseph's place okay, as his sons. Manasseh, uh, is broken into two parts. And so you'll read the half tribe of Manasseh. And this, this particular uh, tribe, half of them wanted to stay on the east of Jordan, along with Reuben and Gad, two of the tribes. And so they were granted permission uh, by God through Moses to stay on the east side of the Jordan. And then the, the other half tribe of Manasseh went in with the nine and a half. So you have the Jordan actually, uh, it's called the Transjordan area, is actually encompassed. And the, this half tribe of Manasseh I've read about it. We studied this in seminary. I've never found a completely satisfactory answer as to why they split up like they did. But that's, that's the reasoning behind it. So you've got the 12 tribes, nine and a half that go in to conquer, two and a half that stay on the east side. And, and it could be one fellow speculated for protection purposes uh, as the rest went in, that they would not uh, find themselves ambushed from behind. Now, uh, in, this, in this settlement Uh, in the east of Jordan. That takes place in chapter 13. Settlement west of Jordan, 14 to 1951. 
Uh, and then the religious community, the Levites, are settled in. Uh, and, then, and then there's these conditions given. Also, uh, Caleb is given a, uh, an inheritance for his faithfulness. So now let's move quickly to the, just the title. The title Joshua uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Hebrew uh, traces it back to the Hebrew Hosea. And, of course, you have an entire prophetic book by a prophet named Hosea, Hosea. Uh, Moses takes this Hosea of, of, of Nun, Joshua the son of Nun, changes it to Yehoshua. Uh, Hosea means salvation. Yehoshua means Yahweh is salvation. So, so Moses changes his name to this. And then uh, sometimes he's called Yeshua. And Yeshua in the, in the Hebrew is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek uh, Jesus uh, and even of the, uh, of the Latin uh, Josue. So Jesus, the name Jesus in the Greek, Jesus, derives directly from Joshua. He's definitely, a, Joshua is definitely a type of Christ. And we're going to see how that fleshes itself out. Uh, his name, one writer said, his name is symbolic of the fact that although he is the leader of the Israelite nation during the conquest, the Lord is the conqueror, salvation. Yahweh is salvation. It's the theme <clears throat> of the prophet Jonah. Uh, in Jonah, when we get there, salvation is of the Lord. That's what Jonah learned when he, when he was faced with his disobedience and rebuked for it and then recovered. And so the Lord is the conqueror. Uh, Joshua is the uh, is the accepted author of this, uh, with a couple of exceptions toward the end. But I just will will touch on a uh, on a couple of things, uh, just real real quickly, if I can find that. Um, we'll get to that later. Some some passages where where it's told that he wrote some things down. He wrote on a stone. He wrote the words uh, of this book. He wrote of the settings. Um, I've already told you about the, the date of it and the setting when it, when it took place. We want to move uh, to the theme and, and the purpose of it. Um, the theme of Joshua is Israel's possession of the promised land, uh, enjoying God's blessings through the obedience of faith. They finally get to experience the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. You'll be as numberless as the stars in the sky, as the sands upon the seashore. Uh, I will give you this land to inherit. It'll be your land. You'll be my people. And the book of Joshua documents this conquest of Canaan by the Israelites under his leadership. Theologically, uh, Joshua teaches that victory and blessing come through obedience and trust in God. And you heard that in the, in the video theme, and I mentioned it earlier. Victory and blessing come uh, through trusting and obeying God. And you hear this warning. You heard it from Moses. You, you, you hear it and see it here. Obey and live, disobey, and, and experience the displeasure of God in various forms. Remember, Moses had said to them back in Deuteronomy at the end of it, I know that after I'm gone that you'll be exiled out of the land because of the disobedience that God would finally have enough and he would send foreign powers in to, to actually remove them from the land uh, just as they removed and subdued the Canaanites in the land. In Joshua, we see that God requires the people to attempt the impossible in submission to his directions before he makes it possible for them to succeed. And the, one of the upfront battles where you see this is the Battle of Jericho. It's a, it's a major city. It's a walled city. Uh, they've already gone in and, and spied it out. And God says, here's how we're going to take it. You're going to march around it. You're going to make musical noise. You're going to take these, these pots. And when I give the command on the seventh day, you're going to blast the trumpet, shatter the pots, which makes no sense to people that have been trained militarily. 
And so you see that in, in Joshua. God requires people to attempt the impossible in submission to his directions before he made it possible for them to succeed. Just fast forward, 1791, 92, William Carey preaches his great message. And people get the title wrong when you listen to him. Many people you hear talking about William Carey say, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. That's backward. William Carey's message was attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. And it's that, it's that same principle that's coming out of uh, Israel's journey uh, as recorded in the book of Joshua. The book emphasizes God's covenant faithfulness to his promises regarding a land for Israel and his holiness in bringing judgment upon the immoral uh, Canaanites. The key, some keys to Joshua, the key word, if you're looking for a word, you ought to know it by now, it's conquest or conquer. And the verses uh, would be Joshua 1, 8 and, and 11, 23. I'll just cite 1, 8 again. I read it earlier. The book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And when he says that, he's not saying that Joshua shall not speak it to the people. What he's saying, emphasis is on depart. It, sh- it shall not leave you. And tragically, along the way, it does leave the people where they actually d- rediscover the law, <laughs> rediscover w- in, when they're rebuilding the wall in the days of Nehemiah. It shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. There's that, there's that L, the listen, or to listen to the Lord. You, you read the book of the law. You, you, you meditate on it. You let it, let it speak to you so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The psalmist would say, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'll hide its uh, word in my heart uh, that I may not sin against you. And that's the principle there. Then in Joshua eleven twenty three, we haven't seen this yet. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. It's quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Um, Someone has said that when you think about, you read Joshua 24 where he's, where he's finishing up and giving these powerful challenges. This is chapter 24 is where he says, whether it seems good to you to serve the gods of the Canaanites or the God of Israel, you, you decide. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's that strong exhortation. And they cry out, you know, we will. We, we will serve the Lord. And look at Joshua 24, 24 and 25. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at uh, at Shechem. When Joshua went into the land, uh, one writer has observed that he, he, he proved to be a pretty brilliant military commander. When they went into Canaan, he fought right up the middle of Canaan and defeated the peoples there across the boundaries. And when he did that, he divided the Canaanites into a, to a northern sector and a, and a southern sector. And he carried his rest of his battles that way and he cut them off so that they could never really unite to come against him. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's quite a brilliant uh, strategy. And you see him as, as the conqueror. So now how, how is he a type of Christ? Well, I mean, you, when you watched the video a while ago, you He's, he's a new Moses, and we talk about how Moses, in so many ways, was a type of Christ. Uh, Moses led the people. He led captivity. Uh, he led them out of captivity. Jesus was going to do that. Uh, let's look at how Joshua, how you see Jesus Christ in the book of Joshua. First of all, we need to observe that there are no direct uh, messianic prophecies in the book, but there's a lot of type, a lot of typology. His very name... Yahweh of salvation becomes Jesus' name uh, in the Greek. And anyone who would speak to him in the Jewish language would have called him Yeshua. He triumphantly leads the people into their possessions. And as much as he does that, he foreshadows the one who Hebrews 2.10, if you want to look there, the Hebrew writer says, it's fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in other words, the Jesus the Creator, 
in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he, he brought many sons. He brought the people into the promised land to, that, to, the, to the glory of, of the fulfillment of God's promise there. He is, uh, he's the triumphant. Uh, Joshua's the triumphant commander. He gives a type for us of Jesus Christ, the triumphant redeemer. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.14. We're going to see some passages now where Paul uh, and others in the New Testament use this kind of language. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.14. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Joshua was that kind of a leader. The only only time they stumble in the book of, of, of Joshua is when they come out of Jericho, having seen God miraculously bring that the walls of that city down and so confuse the people that they are terrorized and they're destroyed by the Israelites that they decide this, this is how it's going to be for us. And they mistakenly think we've done this rather than recognizing God has done this. And so they take on this smaller city called Ai. You'll hear people pronounce it Ai. It's just Ai, city of Ai. And they go out and without God's direction, without God's command, without God's blessing, and they are defeated. They're, they're horribly defeated. And so you find out that this man, uh, Achan, uh, had, uh, had hidden some of the spoils of war for himself. And so he ultimately has to be uh, discovered. There's sin in the camp. You may remember, you've, used, you've heard that term used, there's sin in the camp. That's what they're talking about. And he's discovered and he's stoned to death uh, as reprisal for disobeying God. And so you see this very seriousness. But other than that, they meet with victory after victory after victory. Uh, and some of our hymns speak of that, you know, from victory unto victory. So, so Joshua in his triumphal leadership models that Paul says in Romans eight thirty seven. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So you see, attached to Jesus is this military language of conquering. <clears throat> you see, Joshua succeeds Moses and 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 accomplishes things that Moses failed to accomplish. And so you pick this up in, in, the, in the New Testament, John 1, 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, or this, this superior uh, reality that came to Christ. Romans 8, uh, early part of Romans 8, verses 2 to 4. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. When you think, when you think law, you think about Moses and Joshua. The, so they have this what's called an antitype, a contrast of, of types. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So you see this tie-in of Jesus being superior, Jesus leading us in conquering victory and as, and as much as we walk according to the Spirit and as much as we obey, there's that faith, that trust, and obey. Now then Galatians, so Paul writing to the churches in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 25. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. And so you get this, again, superiority under Moses and Joshua with these, uh, with, the, with the great victories and blessing. It's even more uh, super abundant uh, under Christ who comes and leads us in faith. Then Hebrews seven eighteen and 19. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God, the hope that is in Christ. So you have this Joshua, victorious, conquering, Jesus, more so, uh, more fulfilling. Then you have this, this particular figure, and the guy's referenced the commander of the army of the Lord in, in Joshua 5, 13 to 15. Let's look at that passage real quickly. When Joshua was, at, was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, 
but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now you read that. I know the fellows in the video said this is an angelic messenger. This is, this is a theophany, okay? We haven't talked much about this. We've mentioned this a couple of times. But this is the word theophany is simply a combination of theos for God and phaneo, so theophany, God taking on a face. This is, this is Jesus in his pre-incarnate existence. It's not an angel. Had, had Joshua fallen on the ground to worship an angel, the angel would have done what angels do all throughout the scriptures. Stand up, don't worship me. Instead, when Joshua falls to the ground, what, the, what this commander of the Lord says is the same thing the voice coming out of the burning bush said. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. You're in the presence of God. And so you have this Jesus uh, in Joshua is the commander of the army of the Lord. Carrying that theme that God fights our battles for us. What he requires of us is to trust and obey. So there's, there's this powerful picture where Joshua, who is a type of Christ, encounters the commander of the army of the Lord, falls on his face. And so you have, you have what I think is one of the most powerful images in the whole book that, that shows us something of the person and work of Jesus Christ anticipating that. And then you have Rahab's uh, scarlet cord. Now this, uh, look at Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse 21. And they blessed her after she had taken care of them. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord on the window. They told her, tie that on there so that when we come to lay siege to the city, you will be protected. And sure enough, when the walls fell, hers didn't. Rahab uh, is rescued, redeemed. Uh, she believes in the God of Israel. Uh, this picture, this image of scarlet thread, look at uh, Hebrews 9, 19 to 22. It's a, it's a symbol of the covenant, of the blood of the covenant. Look at 9, 19 to 22. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water and scarlet wool, notice this, and hyssop, and sprinkle both and the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So this is her scarlet cord, but it becomes a symbol anticipating, uh, anticipating the blood of of Jesus. And one writer commented as I was looking at this, and amazingly this Gentile woman is found in Christ's genealogy. Look at Matthew 1, 5, giving a genealogy of, of Jesus and, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse. So Rahab, this, this Gentile uh, resident of Jericho in Canaan is grafted in by grace to the genealogy of our Savior. And her scarlet, in fact, that you may have read some books through the years, there's uh, called the, the Scarlet Thread, uh, where the, 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 the theme of blood, shedding blood all the way through the scriptures that anticipates the blood of Jesus Christ uh, being shed. And what about Joshua's contribution to the whole canon of Scripture? Well, as I said earlier, he's a, it's a historical link that continues the story left off uh, at the end of Deuteronomy. It's a theological history, teaches moral and spiritual lessons, and it brings Israel from the wilderness up to the time of the judges. I would simply remind you, as we've gone through this, in Genesis, God's people were prepared. In Exodus... They were redeemed. In Leviticus, they were taught. In Numbers, they failed God's test at Kadesh Barnea. 
In Deuteronomy, the new generation was taught, and in Joshua, the new generation was tested uh, at Jericho. They passed the test of trusting God and obeying his commands. In Joshua, Israel moves from prospect, in other words, anticipating the day of coming into the possession, from prospect to possession of the promised land. They move from vision, the, the anticipating seeing uh, the unseen, to venture, where they actually engage in experience. Uh, and one of the things you see in Joshua uh, that has been building now is the importance of the written word of God. Just a couple of passages I'll cite for you. Joshua 1.8. We've read that. I won't, I won't read it again. I'll just be the third time to read it. But it, this book of the law will not depart. In other words, this written material, the law that I've given to Moses that you now have charge of, will not depart. The importance of, the, of it being written down. Uh, oral, oral history, oral language, oral teaching would continue. But you're moving now in the book of Joshua into a real emphasis upon, upon maintaining the written record. But one I want to look at is Joshua 8:32 32 to 35. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he, that is Joshua, wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. I want you to think about that for a minute. He wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. This was something, by the way, historic in, in this particular period of time. This is how a leader would get a better grasp of uh, the body of material that he was responsible for using to, to lead and teach and rule over the people. He would write a copy of it. The kings would do this, were commanded to write the copy of the law. So he does this on, on stones. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native-born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark on the, of the covenant of the Lord half of them in front of Mount Gerizim, half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless <clears throat> the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. This is striking to me. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. Let that sink in for a minute. Joshua copied the entirety of it. That took some time. And then he read the entirety of it. So that there was... There was no more depending on oral tradition. Now we have, we have it documented. Read it, reread it. And you have to, I just stop and wonder. In all the many forms that we have the Bible today, do we, do we take the fact of our possession of Scripture that seriously? This is not an easy thing. And then Joshua 24, 26 and 27, <clears throat> verses 26 and 27. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard, this is where he animates them, For it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. Remember how in the garden there was a tree. There was in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. It would stand as a witness, as a reminder that they were not God. They were creatures made in the image of God. Here this stone would stand to remind them. As Joshua says, the stone has heard everything I've read to you. And it will stand as a testimony against you if you decide to treat lightly the things that are written in the law that I've read in your hearing. So you go from conquest to settlement to 
transition. And next week, Lord willing, we will look at the book of Judges. It's, it's going to be tricky to get through. There are so many of the Judges. But it's a terrible time. And if you think of, if I say Judges, there's usually a verse that comes to mind when someone thinks of the book of Judges. Everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Now notice how far they've moved. From all that's written in the law to what's right in my own eyes, what I think is right. I mean, you're, you're basically to a generation that is, that is as if they have just been thrown out of Eden. And so Israel is in for some tough days. Questions or comments or observations before we dismiss tonight? Joshua. Joshua, yes. You have a question about the book of Joshua? Commander of the army of the Lord, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. How how closely, in a, in appearance? Uh huh. Yeah, he is coming with a rider on the white horse. Has a name that no one knows. His name is faithful and true. He's got out of his tongue proceeds a sharp two-edged sword. With this judge the nation, his, his garments dripped in blood. I mean, it's a powerful, powerful image. We we're not told a lot about the description of this of this commander, but it would not be surprising if it was very similar features. If you could conclude that's what Jesus looks like when he conquers. But I think it's fascinating. You on our side or our enemy's side? No. Really the question is, are you on my side? Are you on my side? Good good observation. Anybody else? He speaks. Mm -hmm. Where he takes on, uh, yes. If you go back when, when Abraham has three, three mis messengers, two of them go on to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, one stays behind, and, and Abraham treats him in a very special way. We believe that's a theophany. Then when you have uh, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael in the fiery furnace, there's a fourth, like a son of, son of God in there. Uh, so, and then there's another one where, where one called Joshua the high priest, I think it's in, it's in one of the prophets, comes, comes uh, on the clouds, appearing a, a theophany. And then uh, the Ancient of Days comes, I think, in Ezekiel, another theophany. Yeah, there's a, I'm trying to just think real quickly. I don't know that you could count God speaking through Balaam's donkey as a theophany because God speaks even in, in, the, in the New Testament a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so uh, I'll try to do some digging on that and just make sure I haven't left one out. But those come to mind. That's right. Mm-hmm. Good. So in Judges, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll take a look at that next week then. Great. Thanks, Jason. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, not... And I think, I think what you're seeing there, the people follow the Lord, the, is simply as long as, particularly in Joshua's era and following, as long as there were, there were leaders who were leading them in the way of the Lord, they were following. The problem comes when the judges move away from that, when they, when they don't embrace the written record of the law, when they don't take seriously the trust and obey, trust God and obey. Uh, 
so yeah, it's, it seems to be something, uh, something of a uh, contradiction is too strong, but it's saying some different things there. And it really is, it's about the leaders following God and the people following their leaders. Paul says in Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ, or imitate me as I imitate Christ. And uh, whereas with Moses' day, you had Moses who followed the Lord, but the people who grumbled and complained were not. Go ahead. Exactly, the Shema that we looked at we looked at last week. These things you shall teach your children when they rise up, when they walk in the way, when they lie down. Uh, because when you don't, and you think, well, how far did they get away from it? So far that a couple of times, when I think it's Josiah, isn't it? When Josiah is the king, there's a rediscovery of the book of the law. He tears his, his garment. And then when they return from captivity, you have the same thing where... They've gotten so far away that they didn't, they had forgotten it so much that they didn't even know they'd forgotten it. And they rediscovered it, and it's kind of like, what is this? Do you remember in the powerful scene, I think it's in, in Nehemiah, where he, the people stand all day as he reads from the book of the law, and it's just, they, they're weeping, they're grieving at how, how their lives have moved so far away from, from God's word, what he commands of them. And you get in that cycle, we'll look at that cycle of... Uh, Going the way of the, of the foreign gods, repenting, being restored and blessed, going the way just over and over. Good, good question, good observation. Anybody else? Let's pray.